Good morning. Oh, we're on party mode this morning. I'm impressed. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's really lovely to have you all here at St. Paul's this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kim Riles, um, and I'm a member here at St. Paul's, and I'm also married to uh, Craig Riles, who's the rector here, um, who will be speaking to us later. It is really lovely um, to have Sunday mornings like this morning, and particularly so because we're here welcoming family and friends of the Lockwood family as they're here to dedicate um, Anna this morning. Um, we love them dearly, and it's a real privilege um, to be part of that and to be able to celebrate together. So welcome, everyone, and we hope you enjoy your gathering and time with us this morning. There's also a big celebration happening um, over the waters. Um, our mission partners, Nick and Sarah Arkley, celebrate their first year of the Numa Church, their um, church opening this today. So our hearts and prayers and thoughts go to them, and I will pray for them shortly. I can't believe it's been a year. So, and what a year. So, and they are doing incredibly uh, and a lot of great stuff. So our love goes to you, uh, Nick and Sarah, if you're seeing this later today. But let's focus our hearts and minds on the, the reason we're here. We're here to, to gather and to fill afresh with the spirit of Jesus. And so we turn to prayer. Lord, as we gather here now, we remember your faithfulness. We thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us always. We proclaim that your promises are true and your goodness never fails. In this moment, we come to you and we lay our lives before you. May we honor and worship and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we recognize and celebrate that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Your beauty and majesty are beyond compare. On this day, we join with those who worship, and we particularly think of those over in the Numa Church as well. And we confess you together as one body, as Lord. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we love you. Because as it says in Psalm 95 and 63, come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord and maker. Because your love is better than life, our lips will glorify you. We will praise you as long as we live. And in your name, we lift up our hands. And so together, let us lift up our hands. Together, let us lift up our voices. And together, let's now stand and let us now sing worship to you. Stone. 
Messiah still and all alone. So oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For The Son of Heaven rose again, and no trampled death. Where is your sting? The angels roll for Christ the King. To sing your praise, no. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. the name of the Lord our God, oh praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. shall pierce the night and I will rise amongst the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face so praise the name of the great song. Please do take a seat. Uh, it is good to have you with us. Uh, I am uh, Kim Zavahath Craig, and we are here for Anna's dedication, which is wonderful, and we're going to get on with that just in a moment. And um, uh, I should say that in the Church of England, we have various different rights that we can do in terms of welcoming children into the family of God. 
uh, and that ranges anywhere from infant baptism uh, to adult full immersion baptism. But we also do a Thanksgiving and dedication, which is what we're doing today. The, the main difference is that we um, simply today seek God's blessing for Anna. We want to recognize what a gift she is from God and celebrate in the joy of that and also offer our support as friends, as family, as church family and say that we're going to do our best to support and uphold um, Anna in her faith and Jonathan and Emma and Harrison and just look after the whole family really. Uh, so I'll ask you a question in, in a few minutes about whether you'll offer your support and I'm sure there'll be a resounding and enthusiastic we will from all of you uh, because we're just thrilled to do that. Um, but why don't you uh, come on up as a family? Harrison are you coming up as well? Awesome, come on up, amazing. How are you doing? You're right. Good man. Um, well, this is so, so good. We're going to uh, hear just in a, in a moment from, I think, Emma, you're going to just say why this day is so significant. We ask a really obvious question to begin with, but let's just do that as well. Harrison, I'm going to ask you this question as well. Okay. And if you agree with the answer, then you just need to shout, we do at the end. Okay. Here's the question. Jonathan, Emma, and Harrison, do you receive Anna Elizabeth as a gift from God? We do. Awesome. <laughs> and here's another question, and the answer is we do as well, if you agree with it, Harrison. Do you wish to give thanks to God and seek his blessing? We do. Amazing. Emma, tell us why today is such a significant day. Um, as we've just agreed, today we want to really give thanks to God for Anna and to seek God's blessing for her and uh, our life as a new family of four. Um, as some of you know, I, I told myself I wasn't going to get emotional at this stage, but apologies if I do. Um, our journey in having Anna wasn't necessarily the most straightforward. We hoped and prayed for Anna for many months before she was finally conceived. And as the months passed, we began to question what God's purpose was in the waiting and whether we would actually be able to have another baby. However, today we just want to praise our amazing God for his love, his perfect timing, and his care of us as a family. With God, nothing is impossible. And today, in standing here before you, we want to give God the glory, praise, and honor for bringing Anna into this world and giving her to us to take care of. Um, we also want to just personally thank our friends and family and all the members of our home group, along with a number of people in the wider church family here at St. Paul's who specifically prayed for us along the way about having another child. Thank you so much. The faithfulness of those around us did not go unnoticed, and we're so thankful that God heard all our prayers. Emma, that's brilliant. Here's the question, and again, I already know the answer, but you're going to, I'm sure, join in with this. Will you, families and friends of Jonathan, Emma, and Harrison, do all that you can to help and support them in the bringing up of Anna? Awesome. Let's pray. Uh, God, our creator, we thank you for the wonder of new life, for the mystery of human love. We thank you that we are known to you by name and loved by you from all eternity. We thank you for Jesus Christ who has opened to us the way of love. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as Jesus took children in his arms and blessed them, so we now seek God's blessing on Anna. This is where I am kind of out of practice of juggling babies, orders of service, and microphones. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we praise you for Anna's birth. Surround her with your blessing, that she may know your love and be protected from evil. Hello. 
Thanks, that's amazing. And know your goodness all her days. She might be a worship leader. She's definitely got a feel for microphones. <laughs> um, I don't know if these words... Well, let me say these words now for, on behalf of all of us. May Anna learn to love all that is true, grow in wisdom and strength, and in due time come through faith and baptism to the fullness of your grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we're going to invite Chris and Sarah Collier up, uh, and they uh, lead a a house group, a life group, um, which the Lockwood family are members of, and they're going to pray. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the precious gift of Anna Elizabeth to Jonathan and Emma, a little sister for Harrison, and we rejoice with them. We thank you that you are watching over her as she grows. And we ask your blessing and protection on them all as a family. Give wisdom, strength, and patience to Jonathan and Emma as they bring her up. And may their home be filled with your grace and the anointing of your Holy Spirit be on them for the task ahead. We pray that in time she will clearly understand and choose to accept Jesus as her Lord and Saviour. That you will give her a gift of faith to follow you for herself. Thank you that she is your child. Give her a heart that is wholly yours and a sensitivity to your voice. May she live a life that brings glory to you. Our collective prayer is that Anna's life would be a beacon of light in the world, always pointing others back to you. We pray that you would provide Anna with many strong friendships as she grows up that encourage her to walk closely with you to stand up for what is right and to pursue righteousness, peace, and justice. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Anna, we bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And my prayer for Anna is that she will always know that the Lord is near, that she will always know that the Lord is near, and that the gentleness that defines the Lockwood family would just provide that haven of peace and blessing for you and your family, Um, and that 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 haven of blessing and peace and gentleness kind of flows to your family, your neighbors, and your friends, and your community And so we do pray God's blessing upon you. Brilliant. And we want to give you, symbolically, we want to give you the gospel. But we've got uh, children-friendly versions of the the, the Bible. So we've got some little kind of hard book books that that are safe, probably for for, uh, Anna to eat. You know, because that's what they do. They tend to suck these books. But it does say, taste and see that the Lord is good. And uh, his word is like this. And Harrison, here's something for you. This is a story for you, and hopefully you can read it to your sister as well. How about that? Let's give them a huge uh, round of applause. We're going to uh, celebrate Anna and uh, continue our worship. Would you please stand as we continue to worship together? to scream it out from every mountain top. Your goodness knows no bounds. Your goodness never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. And I'll sing because you are good and I'll dance because you are good and I'll shout because you are good you are good to me and I'll sing because you
You are good and I'll dance because you are good and I'll shout because you are good. You are good to me. continue celebrating. Youth are already worshipping and learning and eating, if truth be known, um, over in the Hope Centre and our hearts and prayers go to them. But the children are about to go off. Just before they go, can you wave your hands in the air if you're part of the youth or children? Hi. Higher. Higher. Right. These guys are going to go and have an amazing time. So let's just pray for them. Lord, we pray that your spirit fill them afresh, that they may know your closeness with them now. And Lord, as the leaders guide them, may they have your heart and your words to share. Lord, protect them and may they have a great time. In your name. Amen. Meanwhile, there are... That's a whole, it's so great having a church full again. There's loads of you. Please spend a few minutes introducing yourselves if you're new um, while the parents take their children to you.
Okay, can I draw you back? Thank you. I just love the way that the thing about church family is it's from the youngest to the oldest. There are conversations coming on here from from little, you know, from little Anna being held on the, you know, lap to our older generation giving wisdom and advice. I just love it. I love that's what church family is about. And we're going to focus and remember what it is to be church family and look at our our wider community now as Miles leads us in prayer. morning. These words were written by Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 28 verses 11 to 12. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Lord, we thank you for your plans for us, your people today, and we thank you that you are listening. We thank you for our church here at St Paul's, for the freedom we have to gather together, the fellowship we enjoy, and the inspiration from worshipping together and the teaching of your word. We ask you, Lord, to strengthen your body here, increase our love and care for one another, and for those you bring across our paths. May we be forgiving, humble, and generous in spirit. May we find an increasing hunger for your word, a growing desire to pray, and most of all, a greater love for you, our God. As we restart more of our church programmes this autumn, such as home groups, children and youth meetings, prayer ministry, we ask that you will be present, working amongst us by your spirit. We thank you for those who serve us in leadership in our church, for Craig and Kim, for the staff team, the church wardens, the PCC. Please, Lord, encourage them and give them the unity and inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We also remember those who are sick, or sad, or bereaved, and ask you, Lord, to stretch out your hand of healing upon them and restore them to wholeness and peace. Amen. Today we bring again our nation before you in prayer. We pray that in spite of the changing face of society today, that your voice will continue to be heard and your hand will guide our nation. We pray for the Queen and the Royal Family, for our government and Parliament. Lord, help them all in their human weakness to be examples of integrity and to act with wisdom. May our nation know, Lord, your blessing and be a force for good in our world today. We pray today for the work of the Bible Society, whose good work we support as a church. We pray particularly today for their work in China, where your church is estimated to be growing by more than one million new believers each year. There is tremendous need for Bibles and for training of church leaders in China. And Lord, we ask you to prosper their work and help the Chinese church to greatly increase the number of shepherds to care for the growing flock of new Christians. Pour out your spirit upon your people in China and may your word strengthen and guide your people there. We continue to pray for Afghanistan. 
especially we pray for the four or five thousand or so believers in that land who are now in increasing danger because of their faith. Please, Lord, protect them from harm at the same time as giving them strength and courage to continue to follow you. We pray that you will restrain the powers of evil in that land and cause the voices of restraint and moderation to prevail. Give wisdom to international leaders to act in a way that leads to a better future for that nation that has seen so much suffering in recent decades. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The reading this morning is Ezra chapter 3. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Josedach, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates, began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. Then, in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as free will offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorised by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedach, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites and all who had returned from the captivity of Jerusalem, began the work. They appointed Levites, 20 years old and older, to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hodaviah, and the sons of Henadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good! His love towards Israel continues forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish between the sound of the shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping, because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard far away. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Um, Last week, we had quite a bit of worship and not very much of the word. This week, we're going to start with the word, but also have worship. 
Uh, and we're going to revisit chapter 3 because um, it's an important theme for us. Let's pray. Lord, as we turn to your word now, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, speak uh, life to us, life in the name of Jesus, about what it means to be a worshipping community. And we pray this uh, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, We've got guests joining us this morning, and Ezra chapter 3 is quite a a kind of chapter for anybody to kind of just come into straight away. Uh, So on behalf of our guests and actually some of our more regular church members as well, do stay with us because I think there are some really good themes that emerge from chapter 3 of Ezra uh, for us. You might wonder why we're studying these books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament. And the simple answer is that together they provide a word of encouragement for a community that is involved in in the project of rebuilding uh, worship, rebuilding uh, the temple in Jerusalem, in the case of the book of Ezra, and uh, with Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, which were broken down, uh, all because of the destruction uh, wreaked upon Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon. And uh, so this theme for us, it kind of resonates with where uh, the church is uh, around the, well, not just in the UK, but in in the world, because uh, along with other churches, we are focusing on this season of rebuilding our community and worshipping life together because of all the uh, impact, the ongoing impact of the pandemic. And there is this deep spiritual call to rebuild our walls, to restore our worship. Uh, And within the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we find valuable insights into the restoration and revival of worship, community, and mission. So those who were uh, with us two weeks ago, we looked at the opening chapter of Nehemiah. uh, And uh, there we got to see uh, what the the prayer, a prayer of revival begins to look like. We saw how Nehemiah grieved over the sorry state of Jerusalem with the broken down walls, with the temple destroyed. The faith community were in trouble. They felt this deep sense of shame and Nehemiah's heart was broken at what had been reported to him, and he longed for the restoration of Jerusalem, and it literally broke his heart. He wept for days, uh, and then he turned it into action. He began to fast and pray to God to intervene, for God to remember uh, the covenant promises that he'd made with Israel. And in that prayer, Nehemiah confessed Uh, what he saw as the sins that he and his father's house had committed that had contributed to the sorry state that Jerusalem was in. And so he confessed. And he was also willing to be part of the answer to his prayer. He was ready to literally go and uh, supervise and help rebuild those broken walls. And uh, we long for that same response in in our hearts and in in the life of the church today. I want to suggest that the same heart response is required. We long for the Lord to restore and bring renewal and revival uh, to his church. And the Lord has done that in previous generations. And part of uh, that process is just to be honest before God uh, and others and acknowledge the ways that we are the community, that we the church have got things wrong in the past. And actually, last week, what we noticed uh, was what changed in the circumstances of God's people, what, what began to change their situation, what started to end this, this where they've been in exile for so long um, in Babylon and uh, then in exile through Persia. And what happened was that God moved. God moved, God acted 
God did a work of heart in the Persian king in, in Cyrus to send some of the exiled people home with the specific task of rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. And it's a recurring theme throughout the Bible that God never forgets his promises to his people. God always remains consistently faithful. He does this because he is good, which we sang about earlier, and his steadfast love remains. His steadfast love endures. Uh, And the people acknowledge this in Ezra chapter 3. You know, when that first um, foundation stone is laid of the new temple, the people with one voice um, sing with praise and thanksgiving. Uh, He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And that continues to be the same uh, today. There is a sovereign move of God. He is good and he sees the situation. And in his own sovereign timing, his perfect timing, God acts. And so the restoration of worship, this restoration project, was a divine initiative It began with a move of God, but it called for a human response. And that's always the case, isn't it? You know, that there is that human response that is needed in us. God uh, has first loved us, but we need to respond uh, to that love. Israel wasn't especially deserving of God's love, and neither are we. But because God is good, because he is because he defines what, what goodness is, what true love looks like, uh, we see God making the first move. 1 John 1, 4 says, it's not that we first loved God, but that he first loved us. And in a way, we kind of beautifully see that illustrated in Anna's uh, Thanksgiving this morning. I mean, she knows the love and care of her parents who absolutely dote on her, as does uh, her older brother. Um, And Anna gives them great joy. Uh, But at this point in her life, she is utterly dependent on her parents for everything. For feeding, for changing nappies, for burping, settling her to sleep, interpreting her cries. uh, And they respond appropriately. You know, as we bring her before God today, she has no idea that she's been brought before the creator of the universe. She has no real concept that she is fearfully and wonderfully made, and yet she is. She has no idea yet that there is a Savior who knows her, who loves her, who died for her. All of that is to come because God has first loved. And Anna's going to spend the rest of her life responding uh, to that love in some way, and we hope in a, in a way that always says, yes, thank you, Lord. That's what we hope for her. God has loved. He has first loved. God has made the first move, and we respond, and it's always the case. When we are talking about worship, which, by the way, is what we're talking about this morning, worship is ultimately our response to the God who has first loved us. Now, there are a number of things that we can draw out of Ezra chapter 3 in relation to worship. I'll mention just a few of them briefly before I go on to speak about the main uh, theme, which I think the Lord has put on uh, my heart for us today. The first thing to say that this whole project of rebuilding worship takes time. It's not a quick process. You know, we live, don't we, in an instant culture. Everything has to happen instantly, but some things take a while. And yet we worship a God who who doesn't have a beginning. He's always existed. Before anything else existed, there was God. And God took time to create uh, the world. Psalm 90 verse 4 says that a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. In other words, we have a God who Uh, likes to take his time about things. And in Ezra chapter 3, the altar is first rebuilt. You know, it takes a whole year until the first foundation stone can be laid. The temple rebuild project uh, began in 536, uh, but the temple restoration wasn't completed until 516. It, It took 20 years And there are challenges and oppositions along the way, uh, which are recorded in Ezra and Nehemiah. 
And it makes me think about St. Paul's and our time. Kim and I have been at St. Paul's uh, here for seven years. Uh, And sometimes I think we're just beginning because it takes time to build a kingdom work. To do a kingdom work takes time. You can't rush that. And the kind of work that the Lord wants to establish is a work that stands the test of time. So maybe we need to, first of all, acknowledge this rebuilding uh, project takes time. You know, it's the kind of thing where people say to me, Craig, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And then I kind of take a deep sigh and go, yes, I know, but, um, but we need to be patient. We need to be patient for the things of God. Um, I think I mentioned the, uh, last week one of my friends, a local church leader, when speaking about this project of rebuilding church, he said we should view the pandemic not so much as a setback, but as a reset for the church. And I really like that. I thought it was really helpful. So this building project takes time. Uh, and secondly, uh, note that they, they build on what had gone before. The second temple was slightly smaller in scale to the one that Solomon built. Uh, And there was some sadness about that recorded in Ezra 3. There were those who remembered the old temple and they struggled with the new temple rebuild. There were tears amongst the shouts of joy. There were those who struggled uh, with the new. And I find it fascinating uh, because when I look at church, you know, uh, you get that same reaction. Uh, from people. I find it fascinating that we can go back two and a half thousand years and find the same kind of emotional responses in the faith community that we get today. Uh, And there are those of us today and we're like, oh, well, you know, we remember how it used to be. It was so good. But now, now in these days, uh, and you get that and I hear it. And it was happening then and it still happens today. Uh, and it's important. It's important. And worship is so important. It's, it's central to the core of who we are. And that's why uh, it, it's so crucial to us. That's why it's so important. Um, and there might be a mixture of opinions and emotions around worship. But what is the most important thing that we uh, need to agree on? And I think um, as a church leader, that is to simply discern what the Lord is doing. You know, what is the Lord doing? And let's encourage uh, everybody to get behind the project of what the Lord is doing. That's how I see my role as a church leader. And when it came to the second temple, it was important to discern what God was saying. Uh, And there's a prophecy concerning the second temple from the prophet Haggai. He said, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. So though it was different in scale, they were still building on what had gone before. New foundations were built on the former site of the first temple. But crucially, the Lord was doing a new thing. Crucially, the Lord was saying that his glory would be greater. Uh, recently uh, in our church family, we have lost a number of people that we have loved dearly uh, over decades together. Um, But it made me think about their contribution, really, as I heard tributes to them. Last Saturday, we had a Thanksgiving service for Margaret Stevenson. And two of my predecessors were in attendance. And I was mindful of the significant contribution that those two rectors have made Uh, to the life of this church. There was also a recognition in the tributes of the incredible work that Margaret had pioneered. I think she was St. Paul's first children's worker uh, on the staff team. She pioneered the work that has continued. And Margaret handed that project project, uh, on to Jane Renyard. And then Jane handed it on to Anna Massey, who handed it on to Heather Andrew. And now Debbie May continues that work. And it's like this relay race where the baton has been handed on to others. But each time we give thanks and we build on the work that's gone before. So we build on the work that's gone before, but God's been doing a new thing. 
And then we look at those who were appointed to rebuild the temple. And it's fascinating in Ezra um, chapter 3, verse 8. It says, they appointed Levites um, who were 20 years old in order to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. 20 years old and upward. The young man who's leading worship this morning is 20 years old, recently turned 20. Uh, And it seems to me that one of the things that we need to do as a church is invest in the next generation of leaders, uh, of worship leaders, of leaders in every sphere. The church nationally, uh, especially I think the Church of England, needs to learn this strategy of investing in younger leaders if the church is going to flourish in the future. It's so important in this rebuilding project. And that's not to say that those of us who are older, and I count myself and other generations in that, uh, it's not that those of us who are older and more experienced don't have a role. We have a crucial contribution to make. But we need to share our knowledge, our wisdom, our experience You know, Moses invested in Joshua, Elijah invested in Elisha, Paul invested in Timothy and Titus. We need to um, nurture our young leaders, help them to set an example for everyone, for all of us in Christian discipleship, as Paul says, in, in, in their speech, in their life, in their love, in their faith, in their purity. That's what we're called to do is to raise up a whole generation of young uh, leaders who worship and love the Lord. That's why it's so encouraging to, um, to see some of our young people stepping into that. That's why we invest in them. But having said that, the main thing that I want to focus on today, if you like, this is the foundation stone that needs to be laid in the project of restoring worship. And it's so simple that you kind of might miss it in the passage, but it's foundational to the restoration of the people coming together. And it's in the very first verse of chapter 3, and it simply says this, the people gathered as one in Jerusalem. Other translations say the people gathered as one man, one person. And the Hebrew text emphasizes the oneness of the people. A key feature of the restoration of worship in a community is unity among God's people. They were like one person. And unity in worship is so important. An uninterrupted unity uh, amongst God's people. Uh, Psalm 133 acknowledges the importance of unity. It kind of takes a... Uh, an image from uh, the ritual of Aaron the priest being anointed with oil. It says this, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Uh, The image is of oil being poured on the head of Aaron the priest. Oil is poured on his head and it runs down on his beard and onto the collar of his robe. Uh, And this consecration of oil makes him holy consecrating him for God's purposes. Um, And so closely related to this theme of unity amongst God's people is the theme of holiness. This dual theme of unity and holiness is so important in worship. Holiness makes it possible for us to draw near to God. Israel was uh, called to be distinctly different, to be unique. They were called to be a light uh, to reveal God to the non-Jewish nations. They were to reveal God through their unique relationship with him, a people called to be holy um, and called to be one. And the issue that Ezra has to deal with uh, in this book uh, is that they've forgotten their true calling. They'd compromise their unique call to be uh, uh, united and to be holy. They'd lost their distinctiveness. They'd forgotten who they were. They'd forgotten their unique identity. They had compromised and conformed to the world around them, uh, and that was Ezra's complaint. And in our context, in our culture, it's difficult to fully 
uh, understand what he's saying. It comes across as a little bit controversial because what was happening was that those who'd returned from exile had gone off and married people from other nations and they had lost their own identity. They'd rejected and lost God's traditions and God's commandments. They were not one. They'd forgotten God. They'd forgotten who they were called to be. They'd become unholy and indistinct. And so they're called to rebuild the altar and start to offer these daily offerings and sacrifices. For us, we find our unity and our holiness in Jesus Christ. We don't need a system of daily sacrifices and offerings in the temple because Jesus on the cross made the one sacrifice, that one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for all. So what's the equivalent of Psalm 133 for us? Well, for Anglicans, I guess it's oil being poured on the head of Archbishop Justin Welby. Although actually, I think probably Archbishop Rome Williams uh, had a really decent Old Testament beard, so it probably would have worked better for, for him. But it is oil being poured on the head of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, this unity, uh, this call to be one people and to be holy. But the sad reality is that the church so often is far from unity. The church seems to be on the brink of division and splitting and disunity always compromises the mission of the church. And similarly, you know, like it pains me to say it, but when I see news reports about how the reputation of the church is is damaged by uh, historic cases of abuse, you know, it just breaks my heart because um, it compromises the holiness and unity of God's people and our mission in the world. And it's so good that, um, that standards have been raised, that safeguarding now is, is, is top of the agenda uh, in, in mo- all churches, uh, certainly in, in, in the Church of England. But when holiness and disunity takes, when, when holiness... Um, is compromised, when unity becomes disunity, it just sends this confusing message to the world. And so restoring true, authentic worship has to be about restoring unity and taking seriously the pursuit of holiness You know, one of the great tragedies is when we allow worship to divide us. And the enemy of our faith loves it because it makes a mockery of the very purpose uh, and focus of worship, which is to glorify God and to unite his people together in this joyful act of bringing our worship to the Lord. So that little phrase in Ezra 3, the people gathered together as one in Jerusalem is really significant for us. I, like one of my high values as a church leader is just to be authentic and to be vulnerable. And so I've been praying about whether to talk about this with you. And I just decided that actually, prayerfully it's the right thing to do in the spirit of the prayer of Nehemiah of acknowledging our mistakes and moving forward and I just wanted to mention an episode in the life of our church a few years ago where we had a meeting uh, in this building before our annual church meeting and we had a meeting on the topic of worship and there was a sense that worship was becoming contentious in the life of the church And we wanted to give the church family an opportunity to share uh, their views. And my intention was that that would draw us together in a spirit of unity. But I think I was a little bit naive because that didn't happen. What was intended to draw us together in a spirit of unity became something where we lost sight of what it was to be a church family in that meeting. We lost focus on the one whom we gather to worship and the one who calls us to deeper unity and to holiness. 
And I think on that day, we lost some ground in the project of restoring worship in this place. On that day, some, some good things were said, but also some unholy views were expressed. And it broke my heart because people focused on their own preferences. I don't think we particularly listened well to each other on that day. We were not united. There were casualties in that meeting. It was a contributory factor to our worship pastor leaving the team. Not the only reason, but a contributing factor. And I mention it not to bring up a painful memory, which it still is for me, but with a sincere hope and prayer that we might do better as a church family in the future. Because I think the Lord in the future may want us to appoint another worship pastor. <laughs> Genuinely believe that. And I think we need to kind of just do better as a church community. I don't know whether we will or not appoint someone. We're a long way from doing that. The Lord would have to provide the resources for it. But what I want to say is the way that we talk and pursue worship as a church matters. Right? It should not divide us. It should unite us. And as we rebuild worship, we should always have in mind the importance of unity and remember that the one whom we worship calls us to be united, calls us to be holy. This is a hard talk for me to give to you. And I kind of wanted to avoid saying some of this stuff. Because it kind of, it just feels really tough to share. But also, I just believe in being real. And, and, I, and I want us to move into renewal as a church. I just want that so much. And, um, and I know that God's got to do a huge work in me. And he's not finished with any of us yet. You know, in John 17, Jesus prays uh, for those of us uh, who will Come on to believe. And uh, he says this, this prayer is so vital for the church. Jesus prays, just prayed for his disciples, and now he prays for all of us in advance of us coming to faith. It's an incredible chapter, John 17. And he says this, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they might be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you had loved me. God has given us his glory to be revealed amongst us as we gather together, as we worship as one people. May that be true of us. We find unity and holiness revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Paul, writing in Corinthians, says, Christ Jesus has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness holiness, and redemption. And our worship ought to lead us to, to holy encounter and holy transformation. I mentioned last week uh, what William Temple, another former Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, he, he said this, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God. To feed the mind with the truth of God. To purge the imagination by the beauty of God. To open the heart to the love of God. To devote the will to the purpose of God. 
I love that. It's so deep. I sent it out to you in my uh, weekly update, that quote. Let's turn back to worship. Can I invite you to stand? Come on up. Come on up, worship band. Let's pray. Lord, we declare that you are good, that your steadfast love endures forever. And just like Nehemiah, I want to pray uh, on behalf of us, and actually on behalf of our uh, kind of father's house, as Nehemiah puts it, of other generations just in our local church, Lord, I want to say that we are truly sorry in the life and history of St. Paul's where in the past we have made worship into something it should not be, where we have reduced some worship to our own preferences rather than worshiping you in the beauty and splendor of your holiness. Lord, we are truly sorry and we seek your forgiveness. And we pray that you would have mercy on us. We pray that where we need to amend our ways, that you would help us start with me, uh, start with us, that we might experience renewal. And above all else, that we might encounter your presence and your glory as we worship you in this place, week in, week out. Lord, as we worship, would you bring healing and wholeness? As we worship, would you reveal your truth and beauty? Amen. God take us back to the place we began. The simple pursuit of nothing but you. The innocence of God take us back May God take us back To an unsworthy faith The power of your name A heart beating for Your kingdom to reign A church that is known For your presence again May God take us back because nothing and no one comes close to you Nothing could ever come close And nothing and no one is you and you only Nothing could ever come close Keep our hearts real And keep your grace close You're bringing us back Jesus You're bringing us home To an unsworthy face The power of your name A heart beating for the kingdom to reign A church that is known For your presence again May God take us back The 
Because nothing and no one comes close to you Nothing could ever come close And nothing and no one is you and you only Nothing could ever come close Because nothing and no one comes close to you Nothing could ever come close Nothing and no one is you and you only Nothing could ever come close Because nothing and no one comes close to you Nothing could ever come close Because nothing or no one comes close to you Nothing could ever come close Nothing or no one is you and you only Nothing could ever come close
with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of his brilliance the king of glory the king of all kings oh this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross and all you would lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me all that you've done for me So worthy is the Lamb who was slain And worthy is the King who conquered the grave And worthy is the Lamb who was slain And worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross And oh, you would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me All that you've done for me This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross And oh, you would lay down your life Till I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me All that you've done for me and Everything that you've done So all in the name of love We're singing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave.
Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, oh. Peace and bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name. Still, you call the seas to still, the rage in me to still, and everywhere at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, oh. You call these bones to live You call these lungs to sing Once again I will praise Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus You silence me and Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, lift up the name of Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, oh. For your name is light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive and forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Come on, church, let's declare. Your name is alive that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name Forever lifts its eyes. Your name cannot be overcome. But Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. And Jesus, Jesus. Make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, what a powerful name it is! What a powerful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is! Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, 
and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus death could not death could not hold you the veil torn before you you silence the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again For you have no rival For you have no equal Now and forever, God, you reign For yours is the kingdom Yours is the glory Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. And nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name. stands against what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Lord, your name is beautiful. And there is nothing that can stand against us. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you have brought us here together. And we worship you. In one minute, uh, we need to be going. That includes me. I have to remember. I've got a little one to go and pick up as well um, the, from the children's groups. Uh, also, I love worshipping. Everyone knows that I love worshipping. I'm the one that's singing down here. I'm, I'm the happiest person now that I can sing again. Um, and if you'd love that opportunity to unite, to be together, then we have got the evening, so, uh, evening gathering here at 6.30. I'm Six o'clock, he's nodding at me. I don't know, we're here all the time. <laughs> Six o'clock. Um, it's not streamed, so it is in person. It's really relaxed, it's really informal, and it's an amazing time just to pray, listen, and worship. And we'd love to see you there. Um, I'm going to do a blessing in a minute. Um, and then um, as you leave, can I ask that we still use the one way system so that you leave through the back door that way especially as the weather is actually turned nice again so you can have a great time out there thank you for joining us the Lockwood family and friends it's been lovely to have you with us let's just end with a blessing God 
you are so good. And your word is the lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And we thank you that we can live in your light and walk in your truth. May the things that you have revealed and the thoughts that we have shared dwell in our hearts and stir us to action. Give us the patience and rejoice in all that's gone before. Help us also to discern what new things God is doing. Unite us together and help us to keep holy. So may the hand, may the Father's hand keep us from stumbling. The footprints of Jesus give us the confidence to follow and the fire of the Spirit keep us warm and safe in our walk together as we strive to see kingdom growth and unity with God today. May we live a daily life of worship leading to holy encounters and holy transformation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful week. It's been wonderful seeing you, and we'll see you again next week. God bless.